Well, once again, it is a, a joy to be with my family in Christ this morning. Um, honestly, there's no better place that we could be than in the house of the Lord, uh, reading his word, singing his praises. Uh, this morning, I have the joy of, of starting uh, a sermon series in Philemon. Um, I'm not certain how many it's going to be, maybe three, maybe four, but today, hopefully, we catch a glimpse of uh, Philemon and the gospel of reconciliation and brotherly love and brotherhood uh, and sisterhood in Christ. Uh, so let's read the word of the Lord. Philemon, uh, it's easy to miss. It's only, it's only one chapter, 25 verses. I'll give you a moment to get there. Philemon, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our b- beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this morning again, Lord. Help us catch a glimpse of the face of Christ, Lord. Help us sit this morning as we go through your word, Lord, in awe of your beauty, in awe of your goodness towards sinners. Lord, I pray that your word, Lord, would be what is heard this morning. I pray that it is Christ that is seen this morning. Lord, I pray that you are glorified above all else this morning, Lord. Uh, We praise you for our family in Christ. We praise you, Lord, that it is uh, through your redemption, Lord, and through your blood, Lord, that we are together this morning. Um, Lord, we ask again that you would be glorified, that the word would be preached well, Lord, for your sake, for your glory, and the edification of the saints. Amen. So like I said, this book is easy to miss. If you don't know where it is, you might have had to look in your... uh, what is it, the, in, the, in the beginning to figure out what page it's on. But this is one of Paul's letters, Philemon. Uh, it's overlooked because of its brevity. It's short. But it's also a very personal book, which is one why people don't often go to it, right? Paul often writes to churches. Here we have him writing a very personal letter to Philemon. Uh, it's unique in that sense because it's not addressed to a church, um, But hopefully this morning, and as we work through this book, we'll see that this truly is a dense book with theology uh, and a gospel message for us, Uh, plenty of application. Um, And like I said, this letter is addressed to Philemon. Now, he was a Christian in Colossae um, and was likely written during Paul's imprisonment in Rome uh, around 60 to 62 AD. Um, And we know this because he writes to the Colossians and and mentions similar people like Apphia and Archippus. Now, the background of this book in general is uh, involving Philemon and a slave named Onesimus who, well, Onesimus had escaped from Philemon's household in Colossae. He had fled to Rome. Um, Now, quickly, we'll talk about this in another sermon, but it should be noted this type of slavery is not what we are used to in our Western sense. Um, In those days, you would have been enslaved due to indebtedness, right? You would have um, maybe lost everything and been in a lot of debt, so somebody could have come along and bought your debt, right, paid for it, and then you would have been part of their household, or displacement. But like I said, we'll talk more about that later. Um, But it is in Rome where Onesimus meets Paul, who was under house arrest. And it is during this time that Paul preaches the gospel to Onesimus, and Onesimus becomes a Christian. Now, Philemon was likely a Gentile, not a Jew. Um, he was a wealthy man, somebody very respected in his community, hospitable. We know this because, well, he has a church in his home, so he's welcoming. Uh, he's greatly respected, and Paul calls him our dearly beloved. And he was a minister of the gospel. Paul calls him a fellow worker. So we have Philemon, who is a fellow worker in the gospel. So, like I said in my prayer, Lord willing, we'll see a picture 
of the gospel this morning, of reconciliation and true gospel brotherly love rooted in Christ. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So it's here, in light of what I just said, he's, he's laying the foundation at this point. Paul, a prisoner for the gospel, for gospel forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, and he's a prisoner in a literal sense. We could say, yeah, Paul, you're a prisoner, like, like it's all in a metaphorical or a spiritual sense, right? We are, we are chained to Christ, thankfully. Right, but here it is in a very literal sense. He would have depended while he was in jail on his friends, on his brothers and sisters in Christ to supply his needs. Um, and he would have been guarded 24-7. Um, what we should know also is that he isn't using his common introduction. Right? In other books we see Paul going, Paul, an apostle for Christ. He's not doing that here. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. It could be that, like I said, this is a personal letter. Uh, maybe he's trying to appeal to Philemon from maybe a lower level or, you know, something like that. Um, he could be conveying some kind of social standing because Onesimus is a slave. So maybe he's, he's trying to reason up to Philemon by holding a similar standing. But what is clear is that he is a friend to Philemon. So why is Paul in jail? He was innocent of any real capital crime, right? He wasn't killing anybody. He didn't uh, steal Right? No, he was in jail because he was preaching the gospel of Christ, that Christ indeed was king, even over Caesar. And in fact, the only God to be worshipped. Ultimately in prison for the gospel, and thus he was a prisoner for the sake of Christ. And Paul will later talk of his joy. And it's good to know that like, his joy is not cuffed to his circumstances. Right? No, he is cuffed to the joy in Christ. It is Christ where he finds his identity. You know, he's not a prisoner of his insecurities or his inadequacies. He's, he's not a prisoner of the fear of men, clearly. Not of his shortcomings or circumstances. And he certainly isn't a prisoner to what could come in the future. Nah, forsake all that for Christ. It, uh, we talked about this this week um, in, in a chat, but he clearly had a rightly ordered fear where he feared the Lord above anything else, right? He, there was a vertical fear that outweighed every other horizontal fear he could have had. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, so again, uh, Paul is in prison. He's leveling this ground for us right now. And because Philemon is in Christ, Philemon is also bound to Christ. You see, Paul is bound in literal chains, but they are bound by the heavenly chains in Christ. So both are in need of the same grace. Uh, something I thought was ironic is that Paul used to be the one, right, that would take people to prison. He used to go capture Christians, and out here, Christ, or here Paul is, the one bound for the sake of Christ. You see, because he had such an encounter on the Damascus Road that he was willing to lose it all for Christ, right? He was willing to suffer. The one who was blind, now given sight, and now fixes his gaze on the one who saved him. So, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, the very foundation for everything we have this morning, church. We are here because Christ is our foundation, the one who which we build our very lives around. The God made flesh who lived a life that we couldn't live, becoming sin and dying and rising from the dead so that we, too, would rise from the dead. Martin last week talked of double imputation, and uh, it's true. Christ died for us, right? Our sins were imputed to him. His righteousness given to us, church, so this morning we can truly say that if we are in Christ, we have been given the riches of all his grace, and we are truly the richest people alive this morning. Amen. So, I remember preaching back in Corinthians uh, and just talking about Paul's gaze fixed on Christ this morning, or, or that morning, and he truly was the one who sustained him through shipwreck and stoning, the one who blinded him in Damascus, right, is now, like I said, the one who his gaze is now fixed upon. Um, I don't know if any of you saw that there's a video this week of Paul Washer talking about how sad he was that people said Christ was their number one as if Christ was the number one on a long list of things in their life. And he lamented that because, well, Christ isn't just our number one, church. Christ truly is our life. He is our everything. Everything that we do throughout our week, we are doing on the foundation that Christ has built for us. He is the one through which we do all things. It's the worthiness of Christ and the gospel that is our hope. Christ, the glorious one who animates us this morning, who gives us life, who gives us breath, the gospel that impacts every area, and nothing is hidden from him. Church, 
Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I got to ask, are we truly satisfied in such a way for Christ that we can say he's our all in all, that we'd be willing to give up the horizontal for the sake of that vertical love in Christ? Did our satisfaction this morning come from some achievements or something we did great? Did it come from the world in some way? Or is our satisfaction ultimately built on Christ? Are we purely satisfied in who Christ is and what he's done for us this morning? When we wake in the morning, and we read this in the Psalms, do we look to our creator to supply our need for the day? Yet Paul was a proud prisoner for Christ. How could he be ashamed of the one who gave all for him? Truly, if Christ gave us his all, church, this morning we should be able to suffer and suffer well and give all for the one who gave it for us. So Paul, a prisoner of Christ with joy. And Timothy, our brother, or sometimes said the brother. Now, we don't know what role Timothy played in this book. Maybe he was the scribe or maybe he actually helped write it. But one thing I want us to draw out this morning is that Timothy was indeed a brother, an essential part of Paul's ministry. And we know this from other scripture as well. Timothy is there. And I can only imagine if Paul, you know, maybe he was frustrated with the Corinthians or weak or whatever you may have it. We're human, right? Paul was human. Timothy would have been there to lift him up in prayer. If he was overwhelmed or unable to do something, Timothy would have been there to lift him up in prayer. I could imagine those prayer sessions were probably pretty amazing. I wish we could see what that was. Uh, but the, what is true about this is that truly Paul and Timothy had a deep bond of love in Christ, a brotherly love. And we should see here this morning that, that our, our ministry in Christ is not a lone wolf ministry. We're not doing it on our own. We can't do it on our own. No, for Paul, this was a communal effort. It wasn't this privatized Christianity that exists in evangelical America that says, turn the lights off, it's just me and Jesus. I just want to do these things. It's, no, no, no. We exist as a bride in Christ. We are a body. When we worship church, we worshiped together this morning. We did battle side by side this morning. When we rejoice, we rejoice with one another. When we suffer, it is together. We carry one another's burdens. The need for brothers and sisters as Paul had with Timothy is so vital to our community, church. To support, to pray, to exhort, to lift one another up in Christ as I've been trying to attend our, our prayer meetings more and more, the need for prayer and our existence together has become more and more evident. How many of us have brought prayer needs before one another and we prayed with one another during prayer night? Hopefully, if you've been there, you see why it's so important. Because it's not just me isolated in my home. No, I need to gather with y'all, y'all, right, <laughs> with you all uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage one another. I need that ministry. I need to offer that prayer to you, and you need to offer prayer to me. This is a grace that we get to experience in the family of God. I don't want casual, and I, I hope we can see again that this was not a casual thing for Paul, nor was it casual for Philemon. Tr Timothy was truly a brother in the greatest of sense, more than a friend. Church, at Christ Redeemer, we are a family in Christ, uh, hopefully not strangers. You know, And we'll see through this book that Paul is... Honestly, or not honestly, but he is he's constantly using the familial language to refer to us. Uh, so Paul, you know, and Timothy are brothers in Christ through regeneration. It is a circumcision of the heart that we are adopted into the family as sons and daughters, joint heirs in Christ. Again, the richest people alive because of this. We get his inheritance. Second half of verse 1. It is here that Paul addresses Philemon finally to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker in Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier in the church in your house. As said in the introduction, Philemon was a wealthy man, a leader, and an elder in his church that met in his home. This was a picture of a household, um, a productive household, in fact. It, uh, Philemon would have been the one that would have directed the affairs of his home towards a particular goal or towards a mission. He was the guy in charge. Now, in this case, we see Philemon, this mission, is the cause of Christ. And Paul's appeal is as a fellow worker alongside him. A friendship that they shared had a purpose and a goal in mind. 
Now, it's unclear as far as Appiah and Archippus are, uh, we don't know exactly what the relationship was. Some have thought maybe Appiah is Philemon's wife and Archippus' a son. Um, we don't know, but what is obvious this morning is that it was a family and fellow workers in the gospel to further the gospel of Christ. So by, by widening, you know, the book is addressed to Philemon, right? But he, now he's, he's bringing in other people and then the home in your church. He's showing us, look, this is not just for you, Philemon. There is wisdom here for the body of Christ, truths that need to be understood for all generation, a timeless truth that applies to more than just Philemon. So like I said, their, their uh, bond was over a common cause, you know, and I think, what are the things people bond over these days, right? Sports, a lot of, a lot of sports stuff, um, social activism. Right? All of these fruitless things that people will bond themselves to, or rather cut themselves to, and in bondage with one another for fruitless causes that have no eternal consequences other than maybe leading people to hell. Or this, this morning, we are here for a common cause, and that is for the case of Christ and to build up and edify. We are here to worship our Lord, and these have real eternal consequences, fruitful eternal consequences. So he goes on to the church in your house. Uh, we pray for buildings. Churches now have massive buildings and lots of amenities, coffee shops, etc. And these are all good. We should praise the Lord for them. But the idea of a home church would have been uh, common in those days. And they, the churches probably would have been led by more wealthy Christians because they would have had homes. And so even within that church, there would have been various social structures, poor, maybe more wealthy. Um, but while the letter is personal, there is a very much a communal and community aspect to what Paul is appealing to um, here. So verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is super common for Paul, um, but it really is deep. It's here that we understand that they are all in bondage under their father, or rather they share that bond under their father. This is, again, that familial language that Paul is liked, uh, likes to use. This is a family marked by the grace of God. True peace between them and God by the merit of the Son, faith in Christ, in the gospel, in the death, burial, and resurrection. They truly were saved from wrath, saved from the punishment they deserved from that Father. You see, God has not only reconciled us to Him, church, He's reconciled us to each other in Christ, which is why Paul could wish peace upon them. Peace is made with God the Father. Surely we should have peace this morning because of the reconciliation of Christ. He goes on, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, this is something that kind of hit my heart this week, you know, when we deal with children or even just ourselves, where we're at in career or where, wherever it be. But Paul's attitude, and you'll notice this in other books, he always has a disposition of what? Thankfulness, right? His attitude towards God is always one of, Lord, thank you. I thank you, Lord. It is common in all his letters, Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, you name it. Paul is always thankful. I find myself, you know, striving and working. I want to, you know, further myself in my career, provide better. And I can find myself at times thinking, uh, what was, you know, some kind of pity party. Oh, poor me. Or grumbling. A lack of gratitude for the Lord. Uh, I confess that this morning. And it's something we work on with our children, right, parents? Like, uh, you know, the kid doesn't get exactly what they want to eat or something like that. And we're like, hey, you need to stop grumbling. Remember when Israel grumbled in the desert, right? Uh, we try and remind them of God's truth. We try to remind them that we need to be thankful for what the Lord has done. And it's not just a generic thankfulness, right? We can even remind them, Psalm 104, or 100 verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Church, are we here this morning thankful? Not just some kind of generic thankful, like, oh, I'm thankful. No. Are we thankful for one another? Are we coming here looking at one another going, the Lord has done a marvelous work in your life. I am grateful for what the Lord is doing in you. I'm grateful to God for what the Lord is doing in so-and-so's heart. The Lord has added numbers. Praise God. That disposition of thankfulness, Lord, uh, church, is something that should mark us out as Christians. Um, 
verse. Sorry, lost my spot. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. And clearly the relationship is close for Paul um, and Philemon, and he's remembering them by name. And that was another aspect of this particular section of verses that hit me is I often thank God, and I'm often prayerful throughout my week, but how often am I praying for people by name? You know, are my relationships deep enough that throughout the week, you guys are on my mind, I see faces in my head, and I go, ah, Lord, I need to pray for them. You know, Paul had such a deep relationship with every one of his churches. He was willing to get in the nitty-gritty, to get dirty for the sake of the gospel and the churches that, uh, that he visited and that he needed. He was thankful for them by name. I could imagine how many different people he knew I mean, he probably knew hundreds, right? Maybe a thousand, maybe more. I don't know. But what we do know is Paul is always thankful for people, and he calls them out by name. He calls Philemon out by name this morning. Lord, or Philemon, I am thankful for you. Again, I just want to highlight, like, if you're not coming to prayer, please come to prayer. This is where we share our heart with one another, where we can know you by name, know your face, and pray for you and encourage you. And draw near to the Lord together. So prayer is a priority for Paul. Verse 5, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So here it is. There is Paul's reason for thanksgiving. Because he hears of, of the love that Philemon has. And of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. You see, faith in Christ... And love towards our saints, uh, they're deeply intertwined. It, it can't be possible that we are so in love with the Lord and grateful and all this, and yet have zero love for our brothers and sisters here this morning. We should have such a love for Christ's bride as he does. If he loves us, church, how could we not love one another? Uh, we can't be those Christians, and I don't, I don't think that's us here this morning, clearly, because we're here. But we've all heard those Christians where it's like, oh, no, I love God. Yeah, I read the Bible. Ah, I just don't like the church, you know. Ah, the church has hurt me or the church is that's full of hypocrites, right? And there's that cliche, well, there's always room for one more hypocrite, right? <laughs> Amen. Yep, yep, right here. Uh, we can't be those Christians. They, they don't actually exist. If the Lord is doing a work in your heart, the Lord's day is the best day of the week. This is where we gather to be with one another, to love one another in Christ. This is family, church. Was it hard to get yourself up this morning? You thought, nah, I might be able to miss today. If that was you, check your heart. Check your heart. And pray for the Lord to change him. All throughout the Psalms, David is doing what? Crying out to the Lord for his need. Now, Paul, Paul could say this easily. Paul clearly uh, has a, a love and a desire to be with his people. You know, this is something Paul can be thankful for and encourage because Paul is, has no problem, like I said, getting nitty and gritty and getting into the affairs of the church and showing them Christ. Right? He loved his churches. He loved Christ, and therefore he loved his bride. Like I said, faith and love, as I said in the verse, these are the fruit of the Spirit. This is not something that we can um, ascribe to the flesh. Right? Faith and love, these are not things that we can stir up in ourselves if it's a, a will of the man, but these are fruits of God's Spirit at work in His church and at work in us this morning. Uh, and because of this, because Paul knew that Philemon had these fruits, he could write this letter confidently to Philemon and know that it would be well accepted. Right? Um, verse 6, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Again, this kind of emphasizes for Paul that our faith, church, is not isolated. No. Our faith is communal. And we know this because in verse 1, Paul is telling us, my fellow worker in the faith, right? It is in our faith that we are fellow workers. So Paul clearly has partnership in mind and often refers to the people in other churches as his fellow workers or as his partners in the gospel. Now, referring to the knowledge of the good things that is in us for the sake of Christ, or because of Christ, you could say, you ask, well, what is this good thing, right? And there's like a, it's kind of a cliche, or it's almost a meme at this point within Reformedom, where 
Uh, and I think it's kind of a Martin Luther thing where we're nothing more than worms, right? You see the memes on Instagram or something like that, and it's like uh, we're nothing, we're worms, we're the worst. And I think there is a truth to that in the sense that we should mourn our sin. We should understand that that is cosmic treason. But it is here that he is saying that there is good in us, church. You see, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. Sure, sin and corruption still remain. Yep, every day. But you are a new creation. You were bought with a price. You have a new nature in Christ. You see, the Spirit is at work. God is at work in you. There is good in you. Now, it's not of yourself. It is the work of God in you that you can say, of every good thing that is in us. Because it is through Christ that there is good in us. We have peace, gentleness, love, long-suffering because we are in Christ. This is the fruit of the Spirit in us, church, that can make us effective for the sake of the gospel. Verse 7. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. You see, in the worst of circumstances, Paul, like I said, his joy, his identity, it's in Christ. He's got this vertical thing going on, right? These horizontal circumstances, they don't ruin his joy. He can look at the comfort and the love that he's gotten through seeing the saints being refreshed through Philemon. And this is, uh, when we speak of the heart, this is not more than just, oh, dude, that dude made me feel good today. Or like, hey, that was a nice compliment, thanks. No, like Philemon is literally refreshing the souls of the saints, getting to the very seat of their heart, their emotions, to who they are, the core or the inner person, you could say. It is beyond superficial. It is beyond surface level. Philemon uh, truly had a deep and profound relationship with his people, that is something that all of us here this morning should be striving for. I love that we hang out so long after church because it truly shows that we are building culture and community here that is rooted in Christ. Lord willing, we are building one another up in, in truly trying to encourage that person to the core of who they are in Christ, to really dig deep and refresh their soul in Christ. So again, Philemon had a deep and personal connection with his brothers and sisters. It was his home that he brought them to, and I don't doubt that they loved to be around him. If, if Paul has heard about this in Rome, there is no doubt that the church loved Philemon. He brought them refreshing. Philemon loved his church. Now, if that is not you this morning, you could argue, uh, well, one could argue, well, maybe you're not spending enough time with those around you. You know, sometimes we come to church and all we want to do is take right? We just want to kind of come, receive, leave, and that's where we leave it. But that's really not what we're supposed to be doing as a body of Christ. If you lack love, it's because you're not part of this body. You're not giving, and therefore you, you will not receive that grace that would be due to you just simply through interacting with us. There's benefit from being part of a body of Christ. There is a love that can be found in no other place than in the body of Christ because of that work that he has done for you. So if you are missing that, stay with us. If you're not hanging around, stay with us. Partake of that grace and that communal effort that we have together in Christ. So briefly, just by way of application, I'll keep it short. I'm running low on time. Uh, if we are to endure with grace, enjoy the hardships to come, church, you cannot do it alone. I feel like this is a theme I, I, I've harped on before. Uh, it, I guess it just perhaps is a part of my heart, but it is something that we see in Scripture and through Paul, is that you cannot do this alone. You will not survive. Your identity must be rooted in Christ, in Christ alone. Every fabric of your being and everything that you step out and do that day must be built on the foundation that Christ is your Savior. I was reading in a book this week, and the author said something that, that was profound and I think applies, but he says, what we treasure will shape our behaviors and command our desires. What we treasure. Church, this morning, are we treasuring that work on the cross that has reconciled us not only to God, but to each other? Are we treasuring each other as beloveds in Christ? Christ loves you guys. I got to love you because Christ loves you. 
There is no other option. Praise God that the Spirit does this work in us. You see, God has reconciled us to Him and to each other, so we have to ask, do we love the Bride of Christ? I was on a run yesterday, and this is something that kind of struck me. It's kind of cheesy, so bear with me. But as we're running, Brookie picked out some flowers she found on the ground, and it, it, it dawned on me that, okay, we know that this is a particular kind of flower, and that it has a family of flowers, right? And we know that they belong to a particular family, right? There is a kind, you know, you could do it with animals too, right? Cats, there is a kind, we know them, because they have markings, they have things that identify them as this kind. There are distinctives that show us what kind it is. Church, you are a new creation in Christ, like I said. This morning, what should be marking us out is grace. We are a marked people by grace, and we should have distinctives about us that the world looks at and goes like, those must be Christians. They're distinctive. They have the markings. They have the brotherly love for one another that I've never seen before. There are things in this world that God is giving us a vision for all these things in his, in his creation, whether it be through flowers, right? Those things are marked out because they are known by their fruits. Church, are we known by our fruits this morning? Are we marked out? Is it evident? You see, our relation to one another in the household of God is as a family of that kind. We are adopted in. It is not our work. We have no boasting. I, I know I talked about the good in us, but that is nothing to boast about. That is purely the work of God in light of Christ. Church, they will know us by our fruits. Um, and I don't mean to emphasize this to such a degree that you need to get out there and go do things because, oh, well, look what we're doing. It's, we're not gaining salvation by works. But it's something that we should be praying over and asking God and crying out to God, Lord, do this work in us. We need you. It should unify us. Lord willing, we've seen just a, a unity in Christ and a, a reconciliation to one another and ultimately reconciliation to Christ that brings a brotherly love that, that should not exist and cannot exist in other, any other realm of this life, church. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that uh, indeed, Lord, you have marked us out. Lord, we are a people marked by your grace this morning. Lord, may that fruit be evident. Lord, may the fruit that we bear be fruit in Christ. Lord, may the world see that we have a love towards one another that doesn't exist anywhere else in this world. Amen.